Welcome to my rapidly growing YouTube channel. I will be talking to you today about how asset bubbles cause recessions. For a chance to win a $50 gift card, please subscribe to my channel, hit the like button, and leave a comment below. Asset price bubbles are to blame for some of the most destructive recessions in history, including those experienced by the United States. Asset bubbles such as the stock market bubble of the 1920s, the dot-com bubble of the 1990s, and the real estate bubble of the 2000s all resulted in dramatic economic downturns. Individuals and firms who invest too late, that is, right before the bubble bursts, are particularly vulnerable to asset bubbles. Asset price bubbles are similar to Ponzi or pyramid schemes in this way. The eventual collapse of asset bubbles wipes out investors' net worth and causes exposed enterprises to fail, potentially triggering a cascade of debt deflation and financial panic that can spread to other sections of the economy, ending in the recessionary period of higher unemployment and lower output. An asset bubble arises when the price of an asset, such as stocks, bonds, real estate, or commodities, rises rapidly without underlying fundamentals to justify the price increase, such as increased demand. Prices are expected to grow and fall over time as buyers and sellers find and progress toward equilibrium in a series of subsequent exchanges. As the process progresses, prices are expected to overshoot, and undershoot, the prices predicted by supply and demand fundamentals, as economists have proved in controlled experiments and classroom exercises. In any market, prices increase and fall, but over time, they tend to return to the basic value of the exchanged products or assets. Because the fundamentals of supply and demand alter over time while the price discovery process is in operation, prices in actual markets may always be above or below the implicit equilibrium price at any particular point in time. Prices, however, have a propensity to seek or move toward the implicit equilibrium price over time as market participants gather experience and information about market fundamentals and prior price series. The price of a specific class of assets or goods overshoots the implied market equilibrium price and remains persistently high, even climbing, rather than correcting toward the expected equilibrium values, which is what distinguishes a bubble. This occurs as a result of a growth in the amount of money and credit coming into the market, allowing buyers to bid prices higher and higher. In an asset price bubble, additional money enters the market, causing prices to rise much beyond the inherent value of the underlying assets, as implied by supply and demand alone. When a central bank or other monetary authority increases the supply of money and credit in an economy, the new units of money always enter at a specific point in time and into the hands of specific market participants, before gradually spreading out as the new money changes hands in subsequent transactions. In the common process of price inflation, this causes most or all prices to shift upward over time, but this does not happen to all prices at the same time. As a result, early recipients of fresh money are able to bid up prices for the assets and things they buy before the rest of the economy. This is part of the Cantillon effect, which is an economic phenomenon. When market buying activity is concentrated on a certain asset class or economic product due to current circumstances, the relative values of those assets rise in comparison to other goods in the economy. An asset price bubble is the result of this. The Cantillon effect of the additional money drives up the values of these assets, which no longer reflect only real supply and demand relative to all other items in the economy. An asset bubble feeds on itself, much like a snowball. When the price of an asset begins to rise at a faster rate than the larger market, opportunistic investors and speculators rush in to bid the price further higher. This leads to more speculation and price hikes that are not backed up by market fundamentals. The expectation of future price appreciation in bubble assets pushes purchasers to increase their bids. As a result of the influx of investment cash, the asset's price rises to even more inflated heights. The real issue begins when the asset bubble accelerates to the point that ordinary people, who are virtually the last recipients of newly created money as it trickles down through their wages and company revenue, take note and conclude they, too, can profit from growing prices. Prices have already begun to climb across the economy as the additional money has flowed throughout the economy and into the pockets of ordinary people. Because the new money has spread across the economy, it no longer has the potential to drive the relative values of bubble assets higher in comparison to other commodities and assets. Early adopters of the new money profit handsomely by selling to latecomers. Late buyers, on the other hand, make little or no money as the price bubble stalls due to a lack of new money. Without additional injections of new money, or credit, from the central bank or monetary authority, the price bubble will burst. After that, the bubble starts to shrink. Other prices in the economy are increasing to normalize the relative prices of the bubble assets, 
lowering expectations of future bubble price appreciation, and no fresh money is entering the market to fuel any bubble price rises. Late buyers are dissatisfied with their gains, and the speculative excitement that fueled the bubble's rise is now waning. Prices of bubbles begin to revert to those implied by market fundamentals. The central bank or other monetary authority may strive to continue inflating the bubble by injecting more new money and repeating the above stated process, or it may cut back on injecting new money after a sustained period of monetary injections and bubble inflation to tamp down consumer price and wage inflation. An actual economic shock, such as a surge in oil prices, might sometimes prompt a reduction in monetary injections. When new money stops flowing, or even slows down significantly, the asset bubble can explode. This causes prices to plummet, wreaking havoc on latecomers to the game, who typically lose a major portion of their investments. The bursting of the bubble is also the final realization of the Cantillon effect, as it represents a large-scale shift of actual wealth and income from late entrants to early recipients of the freshly created money that sparked the boom. The emergence and collapse of asset price bubbles are strikingly similar to a pyramid or Ponzi scheme because of the redistribution of wealth and income from late investors to early users of freshly minted money and credit who got in on the ground floor. When this process is driven by money in its present form as a fiat currency consisting largely of fractional reserve credit produced by the central bank and banking system, the bursting of the bubble not only causes losses to the current holders of the bubble assets, but it can also cause debt deflation that affects not just those immediately exposed to the bubble assets, but all other borrowers as well. This means that under the correct monetary conditions, any sufficiently significant bubble can send the entire economy into recession. Deep recessions have always followed the biggest asset booms in recent history. The opposite is also true, asset bubbles have always preceded the largest and most publicized economic disasters in the United States. While there is no denying the link between asset bubbles and recessions, economists disagree over the intensity of the cause and effect relationship. Many people claim that other economic issues play a role in recessions, or that each recession is so different that broad causes can't be determined. Some economists even deny the existence of bubbles, arguing that huge real economic shocks, which are independent of financial variables, randomly send the economy into recession from time to time, and that price bubbles and crashes are merely the best market response to changing real fundamentals. However, there is a greater consensus that the bursting of an asset bubble played a part in each of the following economic downturns. The 1920s began with a severe but brief recession, followed by a long period of economic growth. During the Roaring Twenties, opulent prosperity became a staple of American culture. In the second part of 1921 into 1922, the Fed loosened credit criteria and decreased interest rates in the hopes of spurring borrowing, expanding the money supply, and stimulating the economy. It worked, but it worked far too well. Consumers and businesses began to take on more debt than they had ever done before. In comparison to five years earlier, there was an extra $500 million in circulation by the middle of the decade. The Federal Reserve's easy money policies lasted throughout the most of the 1920s, and stock values skyrocketed as a result of the fresh money coming into the economy via the banking system. Throughout the 1920s, the quantity of money and credit was steadily expanded, fueling a large stock market bubble. When compared to traditional savings accounts and life insurance policies, the widespread adoption of the telephone and the move from a majority rural to a majority urban population increased the appeal of more sophisticated savings and investment techniques like stock ownership. While the extravagance of the 1920s was entertaining at the time, it was not sustainable. The facade began to show cracks around 1929. The issue was that debt had fueled far too much of the decade's excess. Eventually, investors, the general public, and banks began to doubt that the continuous issue of new credit could continue indefinitely, and they began to cut back to protect themselves from speculative losses. Profit-taking began for savvy investors who had picked up on the fact that the good times were about to end. They hedged their bets, anticipating a market correction. Before long, there was a tremendous sell-off. People and businesses began withdrawing money at such a rapid pace that banks were unable to keep up with the demand. Despite the Fed's efforts to inflate, debt deflation kicked in. The increasingly deteriorating situation culminated in the 1929 crash, which saw numerous significant banks go bankrupt as a result of bank runs. The crash triggered the Great Depression, which is widely regarded as the worst economic downturn in modern American history. While the official years of the Great Depression were 1929 to 1939, the economy did not regain long-term footing until 1945, when World War II concluded. The terms Internet, Web, and online did not even exist in the popular vernacular in 1990. 
they had controlled the economy by 1999. In October 1990, the NASDAQ index, which tracks largely technology-based equities, was hovering just above 710. It had surpassed 6,700 by the turn of the century. In response to the Mexican debt crisis, the Fed began to ease monetary policy in 1995 in order to support the government's bailout of bondholders. As the Fed began pumping additional reserves into the banking system, money supply growth increased from less than 1% per year to over 5% per year, peaking at nearly 8% by early 1999. The newly created liquid credit by the Fed began to flow into the developing tech sector. As the Federal Reserve began to lower interest rates in 1995, the Nasdaq began to soar, Netscape went public, and the dot-com bubble erupted. The glitz and glamour of new technology drew in a flood of fresh capital, resulting in a bubble. The internet revolutionized the way people live and conduct business around the world. During the dot-com bubble, several successful companies emerged, including Google, Yahoo, and Amazon. However, the number of unreliable businesses with no long-term strategy, no creativity, and frequently no product at all dwarfed the number of these businesses. Because of the dot-com craze, many businesses garnered millions of dollars in funding, and some even managed to go public without ever releasing a product to the market. In early 2000, the Fed began reducing money supply growth and hiking interest rates as wage and consumer price pressures increased amid a rush of liquidity intended to fight the lackluster impacts of the Y2K bug. This yanked the rug out from under the Fed-fueled tech boom euphoria. The conclusion of the dot-com boom was signaled by a Nasdaq sell-off in March 2000. The ensuing recession was relatively mild for the rest of the economy, but it was catastrophic for the tech sector. Unemployment rates in the Bay Area of California, home to tech-heavy Silicon Valley, reached their greatest levels in decades, only to be eclipsed lately by the impact of the pandemic. The real estate bubble of the 2000s was caused by a number of causes. The most significant were monetary expansion, which resulted in cheap interest rates and a major loosening of lending regulations. From 2000 to mid-2004, the Fed lowered its target interest rate to repeated historic lows, and the money supply increased at an annual rate of 6.5% on average. President Bush's ownership society policies helped propel freshly produced credit into the housing sector, while financial sector deregulation allowed the proliferation of exotic new home loan products and credit derivatives based on them. In the presence of money and credit expansion, government actions attempting to shape economic patterns are practically certain to guide the rise of bubbles. As the housing bubble burst like a drought-fueled fire, lenders, particularly those in the high-risk subprime market, began racing to see who could loosen their lending rules the most and attract the riskiest borrowers. The Ninja loan, which required no income, job, or asset verification for approval, best exemplifies the level of insanity attained by subprime lenders in the mid-2000s. Having a mortgage was easier than getting an apartment rental approved for much of the 2000s. As a result, real estate demand soared. Real estate agents, builders, bankers, and mortgage brokers reveled in the wealth, making as much money as the 1980s. As one might expect, a bubble fueled in part by the practice of lending hundreds of thousands of dollars to people who couldn't verify they had assets or even jobs could not be sustained. Home values began to fall in certain sections of the country, such as Florida and Las Vegas, as early as 2006. By 2008, the country's whole economy had collapsed. As a result of locking up too much money in securities backed by the aforementioned subprime mortgages, large banks, including the famous Lehman Brothers, fell insolvent. In other locations, housing values have dropped by more than half. The Great Recession that followed would wreck markets all over the world, displacing millions of people and forever altering the economy's structure. I hope you find this information helpful. For a chance to win a $50 gift card, subscribe to my channel, like the video, comment, and share. Bye for now.